Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Elevate webinar series, a collaboration between AgeWell and their fellowship program, Epic AT, Health Research Training Program, and UHN Research IDEA. I'm Patty Leek, I'm the UHN Research IDEA Educator, and today our talk is on Aging and Indigenous Wisdom, Intercultural Perspectives on the Fourth Hill of Life. Allison? Great, thanks so much, Patty. Uh, my name is Allison Schneider, and I'm the Education and Training Manager at AgeWell, Canada's Aging and Technology Network. We value the participation of each member of the community and endeavor to deliver an enjoyable and fulfilling experience at today's session. All participants are expected to conduct themselves with integrity, courtesy and respect for others and maintain the highest level of professionalism at this session. Disruptions that interfere with the event experience for all other attendees are not permitted. Thank you for helping us to make this a welcoming event for all. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay on AgeWell's YouTube channel. And all registrants will uh, receive a link to this email or this recording as well. Closed captioning of the event is available on the Zoom platform that we're using today. Uh, you can see the CC or two C's icon on the Zoom menu if you'd like. You can click there to enable the closed captions. If you select this, you'll see a white script on a black background with the captions. Please note that these are automatically generated, so there may be some inaccuracies. For today's sessions, our uh, speakers plan to speak for about 30 minutes, uh, and then we will have a Q&A or general discussion to follow. So you may post any questions or comments for the Q&A in the chat or in the Q&A box, and you can find that Q&A box on the Zoom menu as well. You may also raise your hand if you would like to ask a question verbally. Without further ado, I will turn it back to Patty Leap to introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce the speakers. And um, I would like to introduce Dr. Catherine Davis, who's an Alderville First Nation member who earned her doctorate in Indigenous Studies through Trent University as an awardee of the President's Medal for Academic Excellence. Her doctoral dissertation focuses on the experiences of Indigenous members in the education system, and her community-based research explores the dynamics of Anishinaabe learning juxtaposed with Western education methods. Catherine's research continues to consider the impact of education and how it can better reflect the rich contribution of Indigenous knowledge. Dr. Davis is an adjunct professor at Queen's University. As a preliminary reflection about today's topic, she shares the following quote. Where adulthood ends, old age begins. There is continuity, there is no break. By living through all the stages and living out the visions, men and women know something of human nature and living and life. They have come to know and abide by its wisdom. This is what they pass on to those still to traverse the path of life and scale its mighty hills. And that's a quote from Johnson, 1977. And introducing Dr. Marisol Campos Navarrete, she brings over two decades of dedicated experience in fostering intercultural dialogue and cross-sector collaboration. With a PhD in Indigenous Studies, a Master's in Sustainability Studies and a Bachelor's in Engineering, Marisol has been at the forefront of integrating Indigenous values and mixed methodologies into sustainable growth strategies in Indigenous communities across Abiyaya, Abiyala, sorry, I did practice that word, which is the continent of the Americas. Her work is deeply rooted in the principles of Indigenous wisdom and sustainable development, emphasizing community well being. Her current work at KITE UHN is oriented to co-develop patient-centered health approaches with Indigenous organizations and health scientists. Her research delves into Indigenous-led research methodologies aiming to advance local sustainable development while nurturing the intricate tapestry of Indigenous community life. In this webinar, Dr. Campos Navarrete will share her insights into the rich cultural narratives surrounding aging and the life course from an Indigenous perspective, 
drawing on her background as a mestizo Mexican woman carrying mixed New Save, Nahua, and Basque heritage, and her experience in indigenous guided intercultural practices for well being. Thank you to both of you um, for speaking with us today. I would also like um, to offer a land acknowledgement. And um, we would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all of the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, we invite you to take a moment with us to reflect and acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships among our nations and to improving our own understanding of Indigenous lands, peoples, knowledges, and cultures. Metasol is joining today from the traditional territory of the Michisagi peoples of the Anishinaabek Nation. This place is known as Nogojiwanuk, also called Peterborough, and it is encompassed by Treaty 20 and the Williams Treaty. For us in Toronto, including Kathy Davis and those of us at UHN, uh, this land is the traditional territory of several Indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This place is also now home to many Indigenous Inuit and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. And so please take a moment to reflect on the land where you are in. I'm going to share my screen so that we have the slides. Thank you so much, Patty and Alison. Um, I don't know if that was my cue to start, but I just jumped to it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as a visitor of the on this land coming from Mexico. I strive to deepen my own understanding of the local indigenous communities and to reframe my responsibilities to land and community. Today, I will share with you just a bit of the indigenous perspectives about the journey of aging and passing across just a few of the indigenous nations I have worked with across Abya Yala, or as most of us know it, the continent of the Americas. This land encompasses a rich tapestry of indigenous cultures and it's important to recognize each one's inner inherent value. The next one, please. Thank you, Patty. Um, Indiana's stories are imbued with wisdom about aging, celebrating elderhood as a time of honor and respect. As we explore just a few of these diverse narratives today, we will gain a window into how these communities honor their elders, weaving, weaving the, the threads of their longevity into the larger story of the community's continuity. Aging with indigenous communities is a revealed journey. In my path, working and sharing with many indigenous communities across Turtle Island and beyond in the American continent, I documented how old age is dedicated to deep reflection and mindful action in passing on wisdom to those who will assume important cyber and ceremonial roles. Elders' voices are not echoes of the past, but vibrant guiding tones of the present. The next slide, please, Patty. In indigenous cultures, mortality is not an end, but a transition, in my experience. Uh, this is deeply intertwined with the spirituality. Death is a natural step in the journey of life, met with dignity and a sense of peace. These traditions teach us about the serene acceptance of life's cyclical, um, cyclical nature, where the end of the physical presence is just the beginning of a new spiritual existence. Um, indigenous spirituality sees mortality as a prestigious stage of life. The Mexicaneros of Durango in Mexico, for instance, that picture is, is from that nation, entrust elders with the vital ritual of Shura Bet, a cosmic ordering that sustains life and calls for abundance. These practices deeply rooted in community and cosmos exemplify a profound understanding of life's cycles. The next slide, please. The indigenous life course is a holistic journey that honors each stage of existence, from birth to passing and beyond. 
Each phase carries its significance and teachings reflecting a life lived in harmony with the natural world and community. By understanding this, we learn to appreciate the beauty and wisdom inherent in each stage of life. The Indigenous Life Course is an accumulation of knowledge and participation. Among the Nayiri people in Nayarit, Mexico, for example, an elder is usually very busy. They may govern, sing sacred songs, dream the future of communal ceremonies, and share their knowledge and experience through many means, art, song, discourses, silences, work in embroidery, and in the cornfield. This integrated understanding of life's stages guides community harmony and individual purpose for each person in the community. The next slide, please. In my experience, being privileged to have worked immersed in many indigenous ways of life across Sabia Yala, life and death are not dichotomous, but are a continuous journey in indigenous thought. This worldview fosters a deep respect for the interconnectedness of all things, guiding principles in community well being, environmental stewardship, and personal growth. Embracing this perspective enriches our understanding of existence itself. The holistic view of life and death in indigenous cultures is informed by a life dedicated to community service. Elders, like the revered New Sabi on Oaxaca, Mexico, my people, serve on councils that steward ceremonial traditions, blending the earthly with the spiritual in a continuous celebration of life. The next slide, please. Elders are at the heart of most indigenous communities, embodying resilience, wisdom, and the living memory of cultural practices. The role is paramount, offering guidance and ensuring the transmission of knowledge and traditions to younger generations. As such, elderhood within indigenous communities is a prestigious and active state. Currently, I have the immense honor to have the role of in service of Celtal nations in Chiapas, Mexico. Among my responsibilities, I am the Celtal elders at, at their service, doing paperwork and working out logistics for them because they are super busy as community authorities. Every day they are sought for advice in all matters from the familial to the communal to the spiritual, their moral authority and high prestige underscore their integral role in sustaining cultural and ethical frameworks. The next uh, slide, please. Oh, oh. <laughs> in many indigenous traditions, preparing for death is an important spiritual process, one that involves the entire community. It's a journey taken with the support and care of loved ones, ensuring that the transition honors the individual's life and spirit. This preparation is a profound act of love and respect, reflecting a shared journey. Here, um, I am showing a picture. It's a beautiful example on, of the Kumiai grandmothers in their territory, also called Baja California, Mexico. They unite the community through their traditional songs when they accompany other elders in passing. Through songs, they integrate ancestral strength and identity into the hearts of their people. Um, the next one, please. Respect for diverse beliefs about aging and death is crucial in all aspects of life, especially when providing support to indigenous individuals and communities. It is essential to engage in practices that honor these beliefs, fostering an environment where traditional indigenous knowledge is respected and integrated into community care, healthcare, and policy making. Respecting indigenous beliefs about aging and death involves listening to, an, listening to and valuing the voice of elders. The roles as healers, philosophers, artists, and custodians of knowledge are central to community life. When we approach these topics with sensitivity, we honor the traditions that have sustained indigenous peoples for millennia. The next slide, please. In closing this part of our webinar, I would like you to reflect on the profound lessons shared by indigenous nations. Indigenous elders' lives are testimonies of service, wisdom, and stewardship. As we consider our own approaches to life and death, I would like to invite you to incorporate the reverence of aging that these communities exemplify. 
And now, uh, to further enrich our understanding, we bridge from the diverse tapestries of indigenous cultures across Abya Yala to the Ojibwe teachings that speak to the very heart of life's journey. It is my honor to introduce my friend, Dr. Kathy Davis, who will guide us through the Ojibwe wisdom of the fourth hill of life teachings. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Davis to the spiritual stage. I'm Jim uh, Marisol, and, and thank you to Allison and Patty for helping us navigate on this platform. So as uh, Marisol mentioned, I am from Alderville First Nation, uh, which is Michisagi, uh, uh, Anishinaabe Southern uh, First Nation. I am not, I just want to preface the, what I'm going to say, I'm not a uh, identified elder. Uh, probably hearing about the four hills of life would be very effective and very beautiful hearing it from an elder, but uh, in doing so, you would really need to commit yourself to being involved and not try to, um, you know, encapsulate it all in 20 minutes within a lunch period. So I am giving you the Coles notes today, <laughs> okay? Uh, and what I've taken, what I'm sharing is widely available. Um, it's uh, through Ojibwe Heritage, uh, Basil Johnson, and the Four Hills of Life um, by Peacock and Missouri. And I believe that they will be in the chat for you to explore if you uh, so desire. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, this just gives you a little bit of context uh, where I am. Uh, Alderville First Nation is a small uh, community of 1300 people approximately. Uh, and it's sandwiched in between, you know, there's Alderville and there's also Roseneath, which is a farming community. So it just gives you an idea of where I am. Next slide, please. And so with that in mind, Anishinaabe people, um, uh, also, I just want to add that Alderville First Nation uh, has the distinction of being one of the uh, first pre-Confederation industrial day schools. So we have that experience as well within our, our, our community. But still, um, as part of our mandate moving forward as a community, uh, resurgence is really strong and uh, we are connected to Anishinaabe Indigenous knowledge. and. And some of the ones I'll share here is the medicine wheel, the seven grandfather teachings and the four hills of life. And I think they're really simple, elegant, uh, you know, applicable teachings that really can speak to any of us as we uh, walk through this, this shared experience of life. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned the medicine wheel. So imagine the medicine wheel. There's a lot of teachings within the medicine wheel and we're just going to focus on the stages of life. So you can see within this medicine wheel, we have infant, child, youth, adult, senior. So imagine we unclip that medicine wheel and we laid it flat. And this is what we will be talking about. Next slide, please. So this is what we're looking at. So if you take a look at these hills, they're evocatively displayed. Um, you can see the beginning, the first hill begins with a circle and, and you can imagine that as the spirit. And then we have the four hills and then we also have, we end with a, with a spiritual uh, return. So, so it begins with infant and child, youth, adult, senior, and then the return of the spirit. There's a few things to consider with the, this paradigm as well. The hills are a metaphor for challenge, obstacles, tests that we will have throughout our life, which sometimes the uh, traumas, the um, challenges maybe uh, turn into traumas. And uh, it helped me to be a more compassionate person when I looked at the hills and I, I imagined all the travel, all the um, challenges that might occur getting up over each individual hill. Uh, some of us, you know, experience more traumas and makes it difficult to crest that hill and not all of us do. We become vulnerable to some of our experiences that we have. So not everyone will make that hill that will crest that hill and they may succumb. We will fall. That is part of our human experience. As we travel any one of these hills, we may fall, we may stumble. Um, and we may even experience defeat, but we must learn how to pick ourselves back up and uh, it is our responsibility to, uh, to walk those hills. That, that is our own individual responsibility. We can have support, but it is our journey, our specific individual journey. Next slide, please.
so the first hill, if you go back to imagining the, the photograph that we had, the, the image, the first hill is our arrival, our spiritual arrival. And um, we have crossed over from the spiritual realm. And uh, Leanne Simpson calls this, uh, we are fresh from that spiritual world. And Leanne is actually a Anishinaabe uh, scholar from Alderville. We, we arrive uh, helpless, naked, alone, fragile, and uh, you know we, we depend on others. We're very dependent. Uh, we are vulnerable to sickness. We are born with potential. We have our own unique talents and skills that we have to discover, but we don't have character. We, ha we need life in order to, to really um, become um, more of who we're meant to be. We have a, need, a, a very deep need to belong and to be loved. We are a great joy to our community, our families, and where our environments are welcoming and safe, we thrive. We learn the rhythm of our families and the ways of our community. Next slide, please. The second hell is quite steep and there's a lot of really wonderful dynamic experiences going on. And we call this the fast wandering stage of life. And this, this is a quick hill and it's steep. Uh, we are physically strong, we're enthusiastic and fit for the adventure. Uh, we learn about ourselves and we seek to learn in all aspects, including the spiritual. And that comes from uh, dreams, vision quests, those individual spiritual experiences. We are ready for training and effort, um, but in our haste to get over that hill, we make lots of mistakes. Uh, we tap into our individual talents and we discover a sense of who we are. And then once we have done that, we start to come down that hill and we have to think about how do we turn these skills and unique, um, uh, that, like the, how do we turn those back over to our community? How, uh, the learning is not just for the sake of learning. We need to make sure that it connects back to our communities. So next slide. So this is the third hill, and I would uh, hazard a guess that most people that are listening today are are walking somewhere on that third hill. It is a uh, it is a long hill, and it's not as steep, but it is the most formidable hill because we're we're carrying a lot with us. We're carrying the load of the younger generation that we are, you know, helping to parent, and then also our, our older generation as they become uh, more fragile. So this is our adult stage, and we're bookended by those two generations. We, we learn to serve our communities and our families. And it's a, it's a long, long way, you know, a long kind of uh, journey, this particular hill. And there may be even outside influences that we uh, have to deal with, like sickness, uh, in older times, war, well, hopefully not in this particular uh, contemporary time. Um, and so we have to deal with those as well. We may at some point become tired um, and maybe even discouraged. But there is a duty for us on this particular journey, this particular path, that we lead with hope and uh, always keep in mind the beauty of renewal because that's something that we leave for the next generation. And uh, they need to have that hope to pick up from where we left off and continue. Next slide. Okay, so this is the fourth hill of life and this is where life slows down and it's time for reflection. Our bodies are beginning to weaken a bit because we are all time stamped. You know, we're not here forever and we are destined to return to the spiritual realm. Old age is considered a gift that uh, we um, are able to have that time to reflect on how we did with our, with our time here. Did we honor the gift of life? And uh, did we serve ourselves in our communities in a good way that, that moved the uh, community forward? Um, and when we reflect, uh, the interesting thing about reflection is there's acceptance with uh, reflection. And um, it, it takes time to do that as well, but uh, with it comes kindness and gentleness. And so sometimes that we uh, experience that with our older people, they really are quite uh, reflective and uh, kind and they walk gently. 
Uh, we are synthesizing information at this time, and uh, we are moving towards very deep knowledge. And deep knowledge is an amalgam of uh, what do we consider as knowledge that's worthy of being passed on to the next generation? So there's there's information knowledge, like how do how do we, how do we do things, but the knowledge that we pass on is uh, connected with experience and information, um, and with that knowledge we serve our community. So uh, once we've done that, we start to think about preparing for our return. Next slide. So a little word on elders. I think we might have missed a slide there. You can just check that. Yes, okay. So everyone has um, elders that are specific and important to them. And I've uh, showcased three examples here. So the uh, picture on the left is my mother with her aunt. And the uh, man in the middle is someone I actually didn't meet, but he was very influential as he shared his story about being in residential school. And so, uh, he he was very impactful with me understanding all of that experience. And then another one is uh, Dr. Shirley Williams, who, um, if anyone has gone to Trent, will know her really well. She's uh, she's uh, she's involved in everything. I'll tell you this: this lady is a very busy lady, as Marisol, had, um, you know, she had, had said in her earlier words that about um, elders be being very busy she is on so many committees she still teaches she writes books and she's a real advocate for the language so she's you know just uh wonderful and in terms of my mother um she's been very um uh, very generous in her sharing about her about her earlier story and sometimes that's you know that we we experience that with some of our parents and some of our elders in our community and we want to protect those stories and make sure that they move on to the next generation so you know that's th those are uh, elders that can be in our family can be in our community or sometimes we don't really know them all that well and yet they really have an important part in, in our understanding um, as we walk the path too. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So a word about elders. Um, they are our connection to language and culture. Uh, even though there may have been disruptions and sometimes they may not have the language or they're learning some of the, uh, you know, the ceremonies themselves like this, they are still really important to us and we understand what has happened to, um, you know, to have, you know, taken them off of their particular path as well. So we, they're very important to our communities. They are a connection to our ancestors and they represent a core foundation of our community. Um, so at any uh, particular function where uh, the community gathers, you can see that an elder would be present and they would provide a blessing or they're acknowledged in some way. And uh, it's very important within our communities that we practice that. And another point I want to make about uh, elders is their connection to the younger generations is really uh, critical because uh, the younger generation has the modern context of whatever the problems or the challenges might be, but the older people have the uh, reflection of experience to be able to put both of them together. So they need to be together to work out some of the challenges that we've that we experience in our modern world. And this is uh, this is resurgence. This is resurgence in in, in work. Okay, next uh, slide. And part of that fourth hill, and indeed the first hill. I mean, it does appear, appear throughout all the hills is spirituality. Um, but as we descend that fourth hill, we are inevitably returning to that spiritual realm. Realm. We understand that we don't we don't live forever, and we enter through the eastern door and we leave through the Western. So that's the yellow, we leave through the red. Um, Anishinaabe knowledge gathers all this un under, uh, understanding from the lessons that are connected to the land. And I just wanted to give a couple of examples and the language is, works really hard to express that. So for instance, the word Minado means uh, the, great, the great spirit and Minado Shinag means little spirits, which is bugs. So connecting um, the value of insects with, they're not pests. I mean, they have a role and a function, they wake up the world. And so that is very beautifully evocative about Anishinaabe Moan, that it does that. Another word is ba, means uh, when someone is passed on, um, for instance, we had uh, 
Doug Baugh, who had passed on. When we say Ba at the end, that means that they have passed on and we acknowledge that they're in that spiritual realm. The word for dream is Bawajige. So it's connected that there, these are different ways where our, our spirit travels through dream, through death, through visions. And then the, the concept of separating and re regrouping and seen and unseen is very much a part of Anishinaabe Moan. So the effect of what we see and then also what we don't see. And so uh, the language is trying to express those, those, those ideas. Where are we with time? Okay, so I was just going to share like a little uh, story. My mom has uh, Alzheimer's and uh, her memory is fading, fading fast. Um, and we recently, like within the last year, we had a family member who had uh, passed away. It was under very unfortunate uh, circumstances. It was a, a drug overdose. And um, my mom had a hard time remembering uh, her. And she, she would just, you could tell it really bothered her. She really, really wanted to have that connection and uh, she could not seem to uh, remember her even though she was you know constantly you know, you know being uh, refreshed her memory but she interestingly would dream about her and she would wake up and she would share she had this dream she knew her they had a discussion she felt reassured and um you know, that it was a preparation to see her again. So I don't know if we fully understand the um, possibilities with the dream world. Uh, this is not something that we talk about enough in Western culture, but um, the idea of spirituality is quite different for Indigenous people. And so I wanted to leave you with that thought that there's, there's uh, you know, that connection to the spiritual world is not religion. We're not talking about religion here. We're talking about spirituality. And so Indigenous people do feel that they're very spiritual people, but not necessarily religious. And so, and I, and I understand that. I, I just wanted to leave with that particular point that the dream world is an important place um, for us. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So what's this all about? Well, it's called Minobamadswin. So it's a good path, the good life. And uh, we hope that by the time we get to the end of our life, that this is what we've experienced, that we've walked a good path. And there is a saying, the exact same flower does not bloom twice. So we walk the path, but we, we are guided by our own individual, um, who we are and, and our own challenges. Um, and when we walk the path, did we... Were we aligned with our mind, body, and spirit? And some of our elders say, like, the, the biggest journey that you can take is to close the distance between your mind and your heart, bring those two into alignment. And so did we do that, you know, when we reach the end? Um, the other saying I've heard is we are spiritual be beings having a human existence. So, and then another thing I've heard elders talk about is uh, the, the two most important uh, teachings that we will uh, experience and hopefully master is the teaching of kindness, care, and love. And the other one is that we know who we are. So we become, we walk our own unique path and we know how, who we are. And that's important because that's diversity for the community. A community that has that di diverse knowledge is strong. Um, so wisdom is the whole circle of all these things. Next uh, slide. So everyone must walk their own path. That's an important, uh, we, we don't try to interfere with it. We, that's not what, the, what our traditional teachings are about. We walk our own path, every path is different. Um, some people will have different challenges um, and they will have, um, you know, they, they might be different on different paths with those hills. Um, so to keep that in mind, and we walk uh, the hills, hopefully with our teachings, which is respect, truth, love, honesty, bravery, humility, and wisdom. If we have all those things with us, then we've walked a good path. Okay, next slide. 
And so those are my closing thoughts about the past. So it's your own unique path. And I was asked when uh, earlier when we met, um, you know, just closing thoughts about how to work with Indigenous communities. And I just thought I would leave with this particular uh, thought. Um, I've worked with universities and uh, uh, education, school boards, um, so a lot of Western systems. And invariably, things will happen. Um, we're dealing with people. We're de dealing with bureaucratic structures. Uh, things will happen. There'll be misunderstandings. There'll be something will happen. And I would just like to um, have, if, if this is you, if you're working with Indigenous communities, um, what would you do? to make sure that, uh, like, think about what would, what would you do if something didn't work, go as smoothly as you had hoped? Would you drop the ball or what would you do? Because sometimes the, uh, you're the person that's working with the community. So they don't really, the community doesn't have the option of finding out who that proper person is to, to, uh, to deal with. So if you're the face of the person that is working with the community, then, then think about how you would work that out ahead of time like just you know to a little bit of thought into how would you uh, navigate that and I think that's about all I have to say I ended with uh, a thought and I think now is time for some of our questions um Marisol and Catherine thank you so much for um for sharing your knowledge and and your wisdom your 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 hearts your past and I actually would like to ask the first question um because as I'm listening to both of you and you're listening to each other I know that you've been friends for a long time and so um, as you listen to each other, like like what strikes you about about what you each are saying? How does it impact you? What do you what do you what do you take from this conversation? Uh, I can start. Um, I I am always in awe uh, uh, from what Kathy has is is so kind in sharing with me. And when we were studying together in the PhD, it was it was usual that she she will provide this, this enlightenment to the whole group. She, she brings the light into the groups that, that we work with. Um, in this particular one, we did have the, I did have the amazing opportunity to talk to Kathy more before in preparation for this. And with this group with, with you, Patty as well. Um, and this, this preparing the, the, the slides, I, I learned deeper about the Ojibwe, uh, Ojibwe knowledge, which I have been living in Peterborough for, which is, you know, Ojibwe land um, for almost nine years. And I've been uh, mindfully and intentionally trying to learn more about, about these lands and how, how the, the people of this land understand their world and how they live. Um, but every time, every time, it's, it's just the tip of an iceberg. So every time I encounter these this kind of things, is I just realize two things. One, how little I know still, and two, um, how beautiful the knowledge is and how much more there is there to, to experience and to explore. So that makes me very, very happy and uh, to be, you know, to have the possibility to learn about this. Uh, so that's from me, Kathy. <laughs> um, I, I've... Uh come to understand there's a lot of philosophy in our indigenous um, beliefs. You know, like I, I'm, I'm obviously connected to the Anishinaabe uh, perspectives, but when you led, first of all, um, I could really see a lot of similarities between the beliefs of, of uh, people south of the border in, in Mexico and also, you know, Canadians. And there's been some contact, we know that, between the, the indigenous groups. And so these uh, these beliefs, like they, there's some shared core beliefs um, that age, old age is a time of reflection, and there's a lot of ceremony that goes in with it. So, and it's a vibrant time as well. Um, we are transitioning, and that connection to spirit is uh, is really quite um, quite present in both cultures, and not just those cultures, Haudenosaunee as well, like we, you know, we've experienced some of those connected teachings as well. So it's cyclical, holistic, and there's a real role of uh, elders within community. And uh, just to 
juxtapose that against Western systems where, um, you know, there, there isn't that same kind of value that it's, there's more of a, a movement to have them isolated out of the community. And I know that really troubles uh, Alderville, for instance, because we've struggled with uh, what do we do with our elderly? You know, we want them in the community and yet uh, we are always dealing with, you know, uh, Western systems of how to, how does that work? And um, it's it's still, we don't have this one nailed down yet. We're still working on it. It really is difficult because they often are out of our community and, and that's a real tragedy. As you can see, if you can really connect that, the, the role that they play, like being knowledge um, synthesizers, you know, if you take that out of the community, that's a huge hole. Um, if I can add something, uh, also working with Kathy I and mean, in this kind of uh, sharing experiences together, um, something that always strike, like comes up is that we are all indigenous related stuff get clustered in one side and it's like it's different from Western when in fact, indigenous experts, indigenous scholars, indigenous peoples in general, really, uh, we are all experts in intercultural collaboration because we have such distinct knowledges. It's, it's not like it's you know it's it's not this it, being clustered in one huge field is 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 never going to make it. So when when uh, Kathy and I talk about each other's backgrounds, like from from each other's backgrounds, and we listen, we practice that intercultural collaboration and intercultural shared knowledge. So I something that I always reflect on is how Western knowledges, uh, yeah, tend to tend also to be clustered in one side too. But in fact, like we've been, you know, sharing with each other for for a long time now in, in good in, in in the very few good spaces in which this really happens. Um, but in 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 this specific uh, workshop about reflecting about aging and, and dying, we we definitely were very keen in starting with you know res indigenous resurgence of these ideas. Uh, the, what is reconciliation? How does it work through this? And for healthcare professionals, how they can you know if they want to be allies, how can they be allies? And this intercultural collaborative approach is something that they can very they, they can very well learn from from just indigenous peoples we we are experts in indigenous collaboration we have been doing this forever well not not for well yes no forever because uh Kathy, you're right uh now that i am teaching social innovation from indigenous perspectives in the university it turns out that we've been sharing with each other medicines teachings spiritual knowledges forever there's a lot of sharing back and forward since before colonization that has been happening and yes there is a common understanding of many things just because we share the same land the same continent um and uh i think that's very evident once you start practicing this intercultural collaboration with mindfulness and intentionality I would like to jump in here if I could, Patty, um, just to um, go off of what you're talking about uh, with sharing interculturally. Um, Kathy, you did speak to intergenerational connections, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, especially when it comes to innovations and kind of being connected uh, between those generations and how both generations can support each other. Um, yes, and it's, it's very interesting because I'm um, a parent now. Well, I've been a parent for a long time. <laughs> My children are adult children, but I remember when they were young, uh, you know, we're all connected. Uh, that that whole um, journey connects us all. But our young people, that youth, uh, that youth stage, they're disconnecting from us. They're be, they're fighting for their independence. They, you know, they don't necessarily want to listen to the words of their their parents and they need that connection still and they it's really strong with the grandparents you know connecting the youth to the grandparents like that connection is just natural and if you look at the medicine wheel where they are in the medicine wheel like I always use I kind of would look at it visually like they are facing each other and so for them uh, connecting with the older generation is uh, you know our grandparents tend to be more accepting you know like we are running as parents we've got a lot we're we've got a lot we're carrying a lot we uh, are sometimes overwhelmed you know that third hill is very busy and the grandparents have uh, acceptance time and connection with the uh, younger generation and they can help them understand 
some of the uh, challenges that they might be experiencing. You know, it's it's a very uh, a, a rich uh, support system that they have available to them, if if it is available to them, that they, you know, they can reach across that other generation and connect. And it's valuable for our elders too to be uh, to be able to use what they've what they've learned, their experience, their lived experience, and share it with their the uh, younger generation. And and it's a way of keeping that knowledge moving. Whereas it, you know, if older people are shut away, and then uh, that information is lost. And I think all of us can relate to not knowing the full history of our own grandparents. All of us can. Like, how much do we know about them? What stories are did we miss that uh, because we didn't have enough time with them? And so, yeah, and so it's also connecting the whole community too. Once we uh, honor those particular stories, Th those are our stories, and they're also our community stories. And how much do we really know about them? So, anyway, those are my thoughts on that. Thank you so much, because as you say that, I'm picturing the medicine wheel, and I'm I'm realizing that that everyone is held within the circle, mm -hmm. all people and and um, my European background that I don't think we have a sense of holding everybody um, necessarily in that in that way with with the rules and recognizing the wisdom. Um, we have a question. Um, Susan would like to know, thank you for generously sharing your experience and wisdom. I'm curious if you could speak a little more to Indigenous perspectives on the experience of memory loss and dementia in aging. Okay, so um, that's that's uh, that's one that I'm sharing that I'm going through myself right now with my with my mother and then also my husband's uh, mother as well. And so part of that third hill that we're on, like I think it is a role for us to um, to honor those stories as I, I as I was saying earlier. Like how do we how do we make sure that we capture them? Um, in my case, like I wrote my my thesis on my mother's stories, and so. And I and I watched her read them. She still reads them, and I think she's lost um, connection to them. And I tell about some of the stories, like the uh, her her experiences. And I remember going somewhere, and and it was always known as the chocolate bar story. It's a horrible story about racism, but anyways, it's her story about, and and I called it the chocolate bar story. And I would all we'd have to do is cue up the word chocolate bar story. And uh, she could tell it, and there was always some new kind of nuance to the story, and it was just wonderful. Like it's not a wonderful story, but uh, I remember my son hearing the story. She's and he had never heard it before, and she he was in university and he was going in for um, uh, policing. Uh, what do you call it? Police foundations or whatever. But um, and when he heard that, I could see like his whole, you know, he changed with thinking like, is this what a police officer would do? And, you know, it really connected him to her experience. Anyway, um, when her memory started to fade, I, re I remember her, you know, someone would say, oh, did you hear about the chocolate bar story? And she would like, she knew it was her story. And I remember her saying, you know, she started to tell the story and she's she's got a lot of like flourish with her, you know, hand signals and it was great and she's funny and all the rest of it. And then she lost the story and she looked to me and she said, "You, it's your turn to tell the story. So that's our role. We tell the stories and we keep them alive. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. I, I also wanted to add, um, talk, talking specifically to Kathy, with Kathy about this, uh, the importance of dreaming is something that is usually, you know, like sort of like overlooked <laughs> in this in these topics. And, and we both were talking about how important it is um, in terms of sleep care and dreaming how dreaming for, for indigenous elders has become something very substantial in terms of, of making that connection with their subconscious minds and being able to that have connection with current realities and, and being like, it's, it's, it's some, there's something there about the connection <laughs> that, that is still very under-researched. Um, and Kathy and I are very interested in, in looking deeper into that. We are both involved in, in projects related to sleep care, uh, specifically coming from, from recovering those kind of knowledges uh, from, from indigenous perspectives, but also, but also um, you know, bringing back that resurgence of, of knowledges about the sleeping and dreaming and what does 
dreaming means for for indigenous elders and in, in this pro process of aging losing your memory and then you know bring back memories through dream so that's there's a huge area of opportunity there in terms of of research for for health researchers um Kathy and I were just just identifying that for more stories together and the the other thing I wanted to add to um with my mom just practical things I guess there's I mean a, a lot of people in the community are you know like the medical community would know this but uh, with her is the more engagement she has with people like um, you know it's uh, I really try to to get her more involved as opposed to watching television because that's such a one-way communication and um, so with her it's a matter of really keeping her involved but getting her to write things down you know it's 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 just a, a constant you know um, just to keep her engaged I think is uh is the is the uh, challenge and maybe that's not always possible let's say if they're in, a, in an elders uh, facility where they're overrun with staff and all the rest of it I just wonder just how quick you know their decline would happen when there's that uh, so so little engagement so the more that they can we have like an um, a senior group we call them a senior group I'm actually part of the senior group now <laughs> I'm not an elder <laughs> but but we have a senior group and uh, you can see that some of them really look forward to the opportunity to come and sit down and, and uh, just chat with each other and visit. Um, so to keep those uh, threads of community going are really important for our aging population because they, they really truly uh, need that. And uh, boy, you know, once they're there and they start talking, there's a whole lot of interesting stories there that they, uh, you know, I, I always think like, gee, you know, the, the researcher in me or the teacher in me wants to get writing all these things down because there's some incredible stories there just wonderful stories but it, but keeping them engaged and part of that uh, uh you know having a strong community for them as a group too Thank you so much for that. Again, I'm hearing as you talk about the story and dream and the, the value of story and a story that your mom told again and and again, um, and it was nuanced a little bit different every time. Sometimes um, I think the impatient version of that is, oh, they're telling that story we've heard a hundred times before. And I'm really hearing um, you flip that experience around. There's always um, new details. Uh, even though I wrote the stories, I wrote them myself, myself. And maybe there, there might be like an added perspective. I don't know if they exactly happen that way, but they're wonderful stories. And uh, I think honoring them, that's, uh, that's not really the, the important point that all the details were just completely perfect. Um, but what the, the feelings that were shared in them the uh, experiences that were told. Yeah, those are all really important. And the nuances change with every storytelling. If you really pay attention, they do change. Kind of reminds me of when my daughter was in dance and they had this one three minute dance that they practiced. I'm sure they must've practiced it like hundreds of times. And they took their little dance on the road. They were only six years old, the, her and her little partner. And every single performance, there was something new. Uh, and we just didn't know we didn't know what was going to happen. One of them would forget something, or the the prop wouldn't work, or the you know the light was over there in the the wrong side of the stage, or you know. So it just it will the nuances change, and I think it's important that to pay attention to that too. Thank you, and we have another question. Um, again, thank you very much, Kathy and Marcel, for the amazing talk. I greatly connect with the challenges of third stage. How is the intergeneration relations between children and youth and elders? What like where what can we learn about that? Where can we learn more? Is that for me? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's for you, Kathy. I think okay. the, the third stage and and again okay. the intergenerational relations um with elders and and where do we learn more? How do we foster it? Uh how do we foster that? I think having um, elders more involved with young people. So whatever that looks like. I mean, we've kind of thought about it in, in uh, you know, having like an anti-group or something like that, where uh, we try to connect the older people with the younger generation. 
and they seem to be open to it, the younger people. Um, I don't know if that would be the same in other communities, but I think uh, I've, but from what I've seen that there isn't a, a difference because our young people are still, you know, curiously enough, you might wonder, why are they still struggling with identity? They still are. I mean, I, I, I certainly heard that in, in the uh, interviews that I did. Didn't matter what age they were, whatever, what hill they were on, they were still struggling with this idea of identity and who they are and what are their talents and how do they, how do they serve their communities? We're all struggling with that. And uh, that young, fast stage uh, where they're really trying to figure this out and they're disconnecting, not disconnecting, but I mean, they're trying to be more independent. Um, that connection with the grandparents is really important. And I've seen where um, some of our elders, elders in particular, can really connect with some of our uh, young people that are struggling. So, you know, they can kind of lay their hearts out on the line, like lay it all out. And an older person is not judgmental. They're without judgment. They're listening and they're trying to, you know, to connect them to uh, experience and, and knowledge and, and give them some, you know, like help them figure it out. Not necessarily tell them, oh, you should do this or that, but it's just, you know, to give them some reflection on that because, we know young people struggle there with the reflection and being able to put it together, especially if they're going through some real challenges. And so having this, you know, this older elder that can help them with that and connect them to ceremony as well, like that seems to be, um, you know, pretty receptive for some of the younger people. Now I can't speak to what goes on in other communities is what I've noticed here. So opportunities where they can connect more. And sometimes it's as simple as like, if you try to set it up all the time, like you try to set it up, it's gonna happen from this time to that time. That is an awful lot of pressure on, um, you know, where, where it could ha happen naturally. So we need to do other things. And so, you know, if we have outfit making or if we have like a dinner or if we have, you know, skirt making or, you know, hand drum group, these it's a it's a natural part of our um, experience and part of our culture and our elders uh, tend to engage with that, too. And if we can get our young people involved with that, um, that's a natural place for them to develop a relationship because that's part of it. Uh, is how do you develop relationship? It's kind of that question, right? How do you develop a relationship with someone? Well, it's not easy. It's not as easy as it's like point A to point B and it's going to happen between, you know, Thursday from six until seven. It's, it's not quite like that. It's like, how do you develop a relationship? And it's like bringing them together and just, you know, before we um, talk about serious things, it's just sharing time together, visiting I wanted to to just point that out, like highlight that last thought, uh, the how natural it should be, like how how and it is. Uh, in my experience in Mexico, at least, the relationship between grandparents and children, there's so there's some overlapping there in terms of how uh, the connection with the spirit works. Like they're they're kind of like more open to 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 especially to observing nature things that are that are very meaningful to, to in these two generations so there's a lot there's a natural setting for grandparents and children to connect and that naturality is something that maybe us in the third hill or in the second or youth in the second hill maybe a bit like we're so things are so chaotic while we're carrying our own, <laughs> own stuff and in, through, going through our own hills but um between children and and, eld and the elderly and, and and elders there is this this kind of a special natural connection that it's very is fostered in indigenous communities at least uh, from what from my experience and that um, it happens in a very natural way but there's also this did you know that fostering natural natural uh, cycles is something that indigenous communities do very very well mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, just building on that Kathy thank you yeah yeah and uh, it just made me think of a time when I like I was uh, one of the parents so focused on okay we got to get their shoes I was with my son got to get the shoes and uh, the pants and you know all of this we were shopping and he's such a picky shopper blah 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 so there I was you know on that third hill let's go let's do it got to pay the bill blah 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 and um, he looked at me and his grandmother was just just going through all the aisles this is the way she shops she goes she goes in the store no lists and up and down the hot the aisles that's how she shops and my son he broke my heart that day because he said to me mom you're no fun I'm gonna go and hang out with grandma and I went <laughs> oh 
<laughs> Kathy, that is, uh, that's such a beautiful story to end on. I think because it, it shows like every one of us who's been watching has, has a place on the four hills. And uh, as you said, that third hill is, is a steep and long mm -hmm. one. And um, I really, I want to thank you for giving us an, an opportunity to, to hear from you, to learn from you, and also to, um, to have a new perspective, a new, for some of us anyway, in the audience, I can't say for, for everyone, um, new ways of looking at ourselves in the world and how we respond and, and, uh, and the patience that we offer to ourselves and to the people that we know and love. So thank you very, very much um, for your time. And we're so appreciative and it's been a wonderful time. Thank you. Yeah, keep me wish. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you.